Yeah, it is. Can I have a pointer because I know oh, this is a pointer? Yeah, okay. So um, what I will try to do is to convince you that uh, you do need theory in this business of energy. So this is my goal. I will also talk about silicon. But really, my goal is to convince you that actually uh, if it's true, and I very much buy into that, that the basic energy science has a lot to say and to do to help us solve the energy problem, while well, basic energy science goes through using uh, actually quite complex theoretical tools to uh, understand some of the problems. Um, so let me uh, put, so I will have to talk fast, not only because it's late in the day, because I forgot my power. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, hopefully we'll make it through the end of this talk. So, uh, if not, uh, uh, we'll talk about pictures, which is, uh, which is uh, okay. So, I would like to put this in perspective by, t by just spending a couple of minutes to tell you what, uh, by using uh, simulation, simulation based on quantum mechanics and uh, of initial atomic structure calculation, one can hope to do in material science in general, right? And I would like to talk really very quickly about challenges and opportunities there to uh, put the energy problem into perspective. And then I'll give you actually uh, an example from my own work about what we do to understand optical and thermoelectric properties of nanostructure materials. Uh, we also work on so-called materials for the environment and water and acres today I won't have time uh, to go through that. Uh, as I uh, tell you about these examples, you will see that uh, most of the work that we do to understand actual processes are related to absorption of energy, for example, in the case of optical properties or heat transfer, is really to look at surfaces and interfaces to try and understand the role that they play. Because when you go to the nanoscale, basically, surfaces and interfaces. Okay, so what are the overarching goal here uh, uh, of this business of uh, saying, you know, using computation and theory? We really want to understand and not only understand but predict fundamental properties of condensed and pressure phases. Uh, there is a lot to do to uh, uh, actually, in my opinion, interpret and complement experiment. We can make a lot of contribution there. And at the end of the day, we should try to really integrate experiment theory and computation, right? Um, and uh, of course, one of the goals is to also be able to design materials with specific properties. So adaptive materials, as uh, 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 Alex called them, understand how we can tune materials to actually build a material with a specific property. There are a lot of challenges. Uh, I would like to uh, stress that the challenges is not only to do many times to here, we need to do bigger computation. We need to do zillions of atoms for zillions of seconds, maybe. But we really have a lot of challenges in defining strategies and algorithms to compute specific properties. There are properties that are very relevant to uh, uh, a lot of uh, phenomena that are interesting in materials uh, for energy that we do not yet know how to compute. For example, just heat transfer. Very simple, right? Textbook things. There are things we cannot, uh, uh, we don't yet know how to compute really in, in, in a very robust way. Uh, we, uh, I, I think it's very important to do all this by maintaining a close connection with, with experiments. Otherwise, we would not go uh, very uh, far. Uh, and the energy problem does represent very exciting uh, opportunities uh, for us to uh, look at materials which of course are extremely complex. And so, uh, although, you know, I think we have to admit that all the nano business and also the search for materials for energy application has been driven by experiment, right? But as experiment becomes more complicated and more sophisticated, more and more we do need theory and computation to understand materials in the environment. And also we need reliable, macroscopic description of matter, and not only models that just fit experiment, but really microscopic understanding that also can lead to prediction. And the one way to do this is really to start from the beginning and to investigate material from 
the base of constituents, right? Electron is ions, and as much as you can, you clearly start from the beginning and you solve the equation. The equations are all there, have been written down uh, uh, 100, 100 years ago, almost, right? You solve the Schrodinger equation. Of course, it's incredibly difficult. You cannot do this for a lot of systems, but there are uh, uh, approximations that you can uh, use. So let me give you two slides, uh, no formula. I, uh, 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 promise uh, just to tell you the strategy. So most of the calculation that we do and also other groups uh, do uh, to try and come up with predictive mo modeling it, are based on a initial electronic structure method. Of course everybody knows about the course of this calculation which is density functional theory. Uh, it, density functional theory can do a lot for you but there are also a lot of things that cannot do like uh, uh, have been faithful in predicting excited states. So when I say ab initio electronic structure methods, I also mean methods beyond DFT uh, to study uh, electronic uh, uh, structure properties. You have to combine those with sampling techniques to look at dynamical processes and to look at statistically meaningful processes. If you do that, you have methods that uh, give you access not to one property, but to more multiple properties. Topic properties, you can look at uh, dynamical properties, and then uh, you can make predictions. Of course, there are a lot of elephants in the room, just, no, just one in all the strategy, and uh, you have to work very hard at the accuracy, uh, you know, controlling the accuracy efficiency of your technique. And also, there is a time scale problem that is really there because usually we cannot simulate very well. So, uh, a lot of uh, effort in the field really is based on trying to couple these techniques and see uh, what uh, uh, can be done with them. So, uh, um, I'm not going to explain next view graphs, so, so don't just hold these here and go away. Uh, usually, when I present these view graphs in detail, I go step by step. The, man, the way I want to use this view graph today is to tell you that if you want to actually understand the materials that are uh, relevant to energy application, you, de you do need to couple a number of techniques, you do need to be able to control how to couple them and their accuracy and efficiency in a very uh, uh, specific way because you need to compute a lot of things. There will be, as I'll show, excited state properties involved, thermodynamic properties, transfer property, and so on. So of course, if somebody is interested in this, with or without wine, after or before, I, I can explain. Okay, let me go to example. So if we are able to solve, you know, or in an approximate way, Schrodinger equation for electron and ions, so this is how we describe the material, couple this with some sampling technique, we can start looking at some problems. So the problems. I will be presenting mostly in terms of very, very general ideas. Our problems uh, uh, aim at looking at how to take, you know, to take advantage of the solar spectrum for photovoltaics and thermometry. So uh, let me give you an idea of where we stand with the thing that we can do and what we cannot do. Uh, one topic that we have looked at in the, over the years is search for materials for photovoltaics. And we have done uh, quite a bit of work on silicon. These are some of the questions that uh, one may want to address. Uh, so, uh, fundamentally, looking at how light emission occurs from nanoparticles, and also when we talk about the nanoparticle, uh, which nanoparticle? For example, you look at silicon, we talk about a silicon nanocrystal, if we have a colloidal or a metric precipitated nanocrystal, is this the same thing or not? Are we talking about the same material? And then we, in the last couple of years, spent quite a bit of time trying to understand uh, and to build also technology to understand uh, in the computer and light absorption in nanorobots. And this is related to a project that actually we have with the Caltech group, and in uh, particular the name Lewis. Uh, there is a big center down, uh, actually, uh, not only at Caltech, but several campuses involved, and uh, the center is an NSF CCI center that is our planet, and uh, the focus there is to try to come up with ideas of solar cells 
to uh, a split water, actually, uh, uh, not so much solar stuff, but splitting devices for water. And one of the focal uh, cattle uh, used are silicon rods, proposed to be used, and uh, name uses, as you know, uh, in addition to, you know, being, uh, uh, having a broad perspective of energy and so on and so forth, is also uh, an expert in functionalizing the silicon nanostructure, and this is what we are looking at, uh, and we are the operation And then we are uh, looking at something that was mentioned, uh, uh, you know, 10 minutes ago or so, and uh, how, if you shine light on this nanostructure, there might be a possibility that actually, out of one photon, you get more than one exciton, uh, and you have a multi exciton generation. So how do we do that? Uh, what can we really compute? So for a number of years, actually, uh, we looked at the absorption optical gap of these nanoparticles as a function of size, and we tried to make sense of the experimental result. Uh, of course, size is by no means uh, the only factor determining the optical absorption gap. There are four nanometers. You look at the scanner of experimental results, or you know, three. <coughs> you see, you go quite a bit all around the floor, and you are all over the map here. So it's not that you can control and use this material very well if you don't understand why size is not the only determining factor. And so we studied these nanoparticles, understood how the surface reconstruction plays a role in the scatter, how actually the presence of oxygen and nitrogen, and we made, of course, also a very specific comparison with experiment, and we looked at different levels of theory here. Uh, we also understood that if you disorder the core of the nanoparticle, actually you can still have a nanoparticle which is active, as long as you pay attention to what you do at the surface. And um, really, the, the role of the surface is dominant here uh, to understand the optoelectronic properties. And uh, uh, my claim is that to understand that, also the role of calculation, and especially specific calculation based on first principle, is, is, is quite important. Uh, recently, we have gone a step further, and we have actually looked at the influence of how the surface termination influence high energy excitation. So not only actually what you do at the surface is important close to the gap, but it's also important, in, and this is a spectrum, you cannot see the whole numbers, but it, what matters here is that it is a spectrum way above the gap, and what happens with the ligand that you put at the surface modifies what happens at very high energy, and in particular, we found that the absorption may be enhanced non-linearly by the presence of specific groups, alkyl groups, and this gave us insight uh, uh, with uh, about multi-exciton uh, uh, so, uh, multi generation in a, a nanoparticle. This is a, a work that we have done in collaboration with uh, urban design in physics uh, and we have uh, just published. Uh, we did this work with what's called time-dependent and functional theory. Uh, it, this tells you uh, something, and it's of course, of course, an approximate technique, and it is always a very good question to ask: Is the theory good enough? So we do know that if you want to properly describe excitonic effects, this theory is not good enough. We know that based on uh, uh, solid-state uh, calculation. So we uh, spent a lot of time. And Specifically uh, to people in my group uh, who are also here, I think, I in the EU, and I have collaboration with students. They want to be spending a lot of time trying to understand how to actually go beyond this theory, really solving an equation called well, it's a bigger equation that takes into account excitonic effect. And actually, they have done it. There is a paper submitted uh, for publication. Let me not tell you how, in specifically, unless you ask me, but let me tell you that we can now compute spectra by doing the full solution of this equation. And the important thing is we do have a sonic effect now into our calculation for systems that were not possible before. This is a one nanometer silicon cluster. And very important for uh, related to any uh, problems related to any materials for energy, we can uh, describe charge transfer excitation that the theory that I just used before for a silicon cluster cannot do. So we could go and look at polymers, uh, uh, 
system that uh, Adam talked about before, but we could also look at catalysts that you can attach to your nanoparticle, for example, uh, to have, uh, 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 I don't know, splitting of water and stuff like that. So this, in our opinion, is quite a bit of an improvement in what we could do. Um, I want to mention two things. First thing is that usually nanoparticles are not just an isolated object like the one that we compute. Also, you of that already. Nanoparticles are complicated uh, objects. For example, they are embedded in solids or in solution. So the question is, can you actually do something to simulate nanoparticles in a realistic environment? And uh, we have done some work on this, specifically for silicon nanoparticles embedded in matrices. There are a lot of, there has been experimentally a lot of work to actually look at nanoparticles precipitated in solid, uh, solid matrices. And uh, the idea came to us because actually we uh, were trying to understand uh, another process, which was nucleation processes in uh, silicon. Okay, which is uh, how we nucleate silicon from the net. And so an idea and, uh, uh, came to us that we could use similar technique to precipitate silicon nanoparticle in these matrices and finally come up with a really good uh, model uh, uh, for the structure. And we did this for silicon nanoparticle precipitated in silicon nitride and silicon nanoparticle precipitated in silicon oxide. And now we have a way of nucleating cluster in big solid matrices, which, by the way, we hope also to use for another project that we have in collaboration with uh, uh, Alex Nebrowski's group on ceramics. Uh, okay, this is, will be a topic of another conversation. So, um, so we can actually come up with structural models. And uh, now we know how to isolate an interface, which has been really uh, generated in contact with the metric, and we learned a lot of things. First, the glasses are not spherical at all, usually, and we also uh, learned that uh, you have a lot of more strain that we were aware of in contact with the metric. And uh, 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 we then took these uh, 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 structures and we did electronic structure calculation. And we learned a very important thing for the interpretation of the experiment, that the electronic identity of these embedded nanoparticles is not well <coughs> So if you actually want to assign, as it has been done in many, many papers in the literature, a feature just to your nanoparticle in your embedded matrix, well, this is very difficult. Because there are states all over the place, especially in silicon oxide and nitride, that contribute to that. And what you measure and you usually assign to your nanoparticle does not necessarily belong. So if you then look at energy transfer problems and so on and so forth because of how these nanoparticles are sourced and how you want to take advantage of that, we should be very careful. Okay, so uh, actually, so how much do I have? I didn't I keep track of it. Do I have time? I should wrap up. Okay, so you know, uh, this is much shorter than I thought, but it's okay. I can wrap up. and. Um, uh, we did very similar studies uh, for thermoelectrics, actually, and uh, uh, we looked, uh, let me just uh, uh, show one view of here about the thermoelectrics without going into details, uh, where we also uh, did, uh, what I showed before is optical properties. For thermoelectrics, we looked at heat transfer, transfer properties, and we looked again at the influence of surface structure on how the thermal conductivity of the heat transfer actually uh, uh, occur in uh, uh, this uh, uh, system. Okay, so uh, these are all uh, uh, no water. Uh, so uh, I actually uh, uh, am very excited about uh, uh, the possibility of using these techniques that uh, I very quickly talked about to uh, 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 tackle energy problems. Uh, and uh, I would like, not because I want to finish with a pessimistic note, but because I actually feel strongly about that, we need to be very, very careful about how we use the results of simulations. Uh, 
more and more, if you look at the, uh, the literature these days, just also because the clothes that people use are available freely, at least some of them, uh, more and more you see results that are not checked enough. And I want to make two points that are obvious, but you know, there are a lot of young people in the audience, it's important. Agreement with experiment is never a sufficient condition to judge simulation results. So uh, it's not because you agree with the experiment that you're doing the right thing. You need to check your results first, okay? Of course, after checking your results, if you do not agree with the experiment, you have a problem. But uh, I think that in our field, the distinction between this distinction between theory and numerical technique uh, is increasingly overlooked these days. And if we want to make a difference in any arena and in the energy arena, we have to be very careful. Uh, I very uh, briefly uh, uh, talked about a work that uh, has been done and, and is being done by a lot of people. Many of those people are in uh, my group here. In Davis, others are uh, senior collaborators. Uh, let me stress once more that uh, all of these applications can be done and will be interesting if we continue also to invest. Uh, you know, as experimentally invest in new techniques, we have to invest in method development and algorithmic development to actually improve the way we solve our operations. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. Just so you mentioned that um, the results on the, uh, the colloidal particles could help in interpreting experiments on multi exciton. Uh, or multi-carrier generation, yeah. but you didn't then elaborate on that. Can you say more about that? Um, uh, so, uh, uh, there, there are, well, as, uh, <laughs> there, there are many uh, 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 controversial experiments, okay? There have been an announcement done uh, by some groups, including uh, a clinical group at uh, uh, Los and uh, of uh, incredible uh, uh, efficiency generation, other people actually have disproved that, for example, the Wendy's group at MIT. And, uh, um, uh, and then there is a, a number of other experimental results that are all different, a little bit different from one another. And then we started looking at how the experimental results differ. And some of the results differ because the nanoparticles have been functionalized in a different way. And we have seen with our calculation that uh, indeed, depending on how you functionalize the nanoparticle, Actually, the excitation spectrum can change, and this may lead to a change in the multi-carrier generation. Not only that, actually, multi-carrier generation is very much affected by how much the nanoparticles uh, interact. So, again, it's not a really intrinsic effect only, but it's an effect of the whole nanoparticle business. We couldn't put hard number. To put hard number, you do need to have a, 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 a probably a better quality of theory. But I think the qualitative message Today, I mean, it, having spent some time looking at DNA and, and having people get uh, incredibly different experimental results on the conductivity of DNA because it depends upon the environment mm -hmm. and how the DNA is uh, uh, doped, and, if you will. Is, is, it a, is it a somewhat analogous situation? That is, you really, you can't just say that you make these nanoparticles and yeah. get this result. It depends very much on the environmental context. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course, it would be much more appealing to everybody, and we would uh, all be much, much happier if we could do a silicon nanoparticle test. Yeah. But that's not true. Yeah. A silicon nanoparticle does not exist. Uh, 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 you know, uh, what exists is a silicon nanoparticle covered in a certain way, yeah. put in a certain environment, and this, this is what you will use. And uh, this is why also I try to make the point that either you do simulation and calculation in a realistic environment, that take it, you know, uh, into account that, or you don't really make any comparison. So it's very much analogous. Right. I you know some of the work that you know, right. that's Okay, thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> session from UC Davis people and I will hand the podium over to Dan and David for whatever comes next. Oh, I think Please we have two things left, right? We have a talk by Atratzos.